And now it's time for Madison's Mad Facts with your host, Madison Standish. Hey, everybody. It's Madison. Welcome to another Madison on the Air bonus feature of Madison's Mad Facts, where we look at the way things were in real life back during these old-timey radio shows. For our episode, Challenge of the Yukon, We went back to the 1890s Klondike Gold Rush in the Yukon, where Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police worked side-by-side with his husky sled dog, King. Well, it wasn't just Mounties who relied on their dogs in the rough wilderness of the Alaskan-Canadian border. Dogs were an absolutely essential part of survival. So for this Madison's Mad Facts, we're going to talk about the dogs of the Yukon. And with us to converse about canines is the voice of our Sergeant Preston himself, Matthew Bird. Hey, Matthew. Sup? Hey, Madison. How's it going? I'm a lot better now that I'm out of all that snow. I'm an L.A. girl. I like my snow off in the distance on mountaintops. So, let's start with the breeds that were likely to have been found during the Klondike Gold Rush. In our two stories, King is called a husky, but there are also references to Malamutes. Well, with over 600 episodes of Challenge of the Yukon, King's breed actually changes quite a bit. He's called both a husky and a malamute at times, and referred to as the swiftest and strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, which actually is another breed altogether. They're referring to the Canadian Eskimo dog, which looks a lot like a malamute in size, color, and thickness of coat. In addition, there are two types of huskies, which originated in two different regions, the Siberian husky and the Alaskan husky. So King was apparently whatever the writer wanted in that episode. So which breeds were the most popular in the 1890s Yukon? Every one of those breeds were highly valued. Sometimes where the dog owner originated from dictated the preference of breed. Many dogs were brought into the region, but it could take a long time to transport sled teams, so men started breeding the dogs locally. Ultimately, the need for strong-pulling sled dogs led to a great many of these breeds being bred together as mixes. Unless directly brought from their region of origin, there weren't very many purebreds, but they all had the necessities in common. Size, strength, thickness of coat, and endurance to the harsh winters of the Yukon. There are a few other breeds they tried too, right? Oh yes. Europeans brought over hunting dogs like foxhounds. There were Middle Eastern breeds like the Saluki, and they also imported large, strong breeds like the Newfoundland from Eastern Canada and the St. Bernard. Unfortunately, most of these breeds could not stand up to the harsh winters, which averaged 50 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. To counteract that, some men tried breeding the Newfoundlands and the St. Bernards with semi-domesticated wolves. I'm guessing that crossbreeding didn't lead to a bunch of really cool white fang dogs like Jack London wrote about? Not really. Uh, I mean, Jack London did paint a very realistic portrayal of the dogs of the Yukon. But when it comes to wolf-dog hybrids, it rarely worked out. While most domesticated dogs are believed to have descended from wolves or other wild canines, that was a centuries-long task of selective breeding. Just to take wild wolves and throw them in with domesticated dogs, the end result wasn't what they wanted. Instead of leading the Newfoundlands and St. Bernards with thick, enduring coats, it bred in the aggressiveness of the untamed wolves. And remember, while huskies and malamutes most closely resemble wolves in their appearance, they are considerably smaller. Newfoundlands and St. Bernards are very large breeds already, and then they were getting the aggression in the size of the wolves. It just wasn't a great combination. So, the main duty of a sled dog was, duh, pulling a sled? Yes, that's right. Uh, The most sought-after trait of the dogs in the Yukon was their ability and agility to pull sleds. The size of the team was usually determined by the need of their owner and the size and strength of the dogs he owned. Some sleds could be pulled by four dogs in a single-file row. Others required teams from six to twelve or more, where they would be lined up two by two. How a dog was positioned on the team was chosen very specifically by their owner. The lead dog, like King, wasn't necessarily the fastest, but would be the dog most in tune with its owner and best at understanding the directional changes and commands given. 
Behind the lead dog would be the swing dogs, who were the expert at navigating turns. The middle dogs were the team dogs, who drove the power of the entire team. And the wheel dogs were the ones closest to the sled, who were the strongest. I love this part. Tell us what happened when the dogs were done sledding for the day. Well, understand the atmosphere of the region at this time. While the dogs were highly valued by their owners for the tasks they performed, no one was building kennels or keeping their dogs stabled like you might a horse. When the teams were unleashed for the night, they more often than not had free run of the mining towns and camps. Surviving on human scraps, the dogs would either hunt for their food, going after rabbits and the like, or scavenge the camps for anything to eat. And I mean anything. The packs of these sled dogs were notorious for ransacking the towns. They'd eat leather items like boots, belts, straps, or their own leashes. They'd force their way into buildings to steal any scraps of food they could find, even licking up salt laid on the floors for the snow and ice and eating a, a very valuable Yukon commodity, soap. One dog was reported to have forced his way into a tent where he ate a candle whole, the lit end and all. The dogs used a lot of energy pulling sleds, so they absolutely needed to eat to replenish their strength. The people of these towns and camps adapted to the dogs. They took to stringing up their food and valuables in the trees, in sacks like a camper might today, to keep bears from rummaging through their campsites. Some men built makeshift platforms high up on the stilts to pitch their tents and store their supplies. Basically, the humans were at the mercy of the sled dogs' ravenous appetites. Okay, now explain to me this whole mush thing. I had some trouble with it in the episode, admittedly. Why is the command word to, you know, go, the word mush? A lot of the early fur trappers to the region were French, coming from eastern Canada. Indeed, until gold was discovered in 1896, fur trapping was how many men sought their fortunes in the Yukon. The French trappers used the French word marché, which means run or go. Eventually, the English speakers of the area incorporated the word, changing it simply to mush. So these sled dogs were used by more people than just gold prospectors and fur trappers. Absolutely. While many of the people who were drawn to the Yukon were there to make their fortunes in furs and gold, the mining towns that sprung up around the Yukon River and its tributaries were filled with businesses to support the prospectors. Whether it was restaurants or saloons, like in our episode of Ma Baker's Pies, or general stores providing supplies, these businesses needed materials shipped from bigger cities. The only way to reach these towns in the Yukon was through the snow and ice covered passes, so sled dogs were used to haul freight. The dogs were also used to transport the mail, which wasn't a very speedy process, taking upwards of six months during the winter season and often delivering very soggy letters. <laughs> but the people of the Yukon relied on these dogs for more than just the jobs they performed, right? There was definitely a companionship between the dogs and their owners, especially when these men would be alone prospecting for months with only their dogs for company. Even the prospectors who had brought their wives and children to the Yukon didn't bring them to work their claims out on the river. It was just too dangerous. So families may be separated for months, and each claim encompassed miles of land, so two different prospectors might not run across each other as they each worked on their own claim. Plus, the dogs would be protection from predators like wolves or bears, and there were plenty of stories of dogs saving their human's life after an accident or an injury. And sled dogs are still being used today? Sure. Uh, eventually, snowmobiles and airplanes replaced the need for sled dogs as a necessity of survival in the Yukon. But the traditions started during the time of the Klondike Gold Rush are still celebrated today with competitions and events. Well, thank you, Matthew, for talking with us about the dogs of the Yukon. Absolutely. My pleasure. And thank you guys for listening to our little bonus feature of Madison's Mad Facts. And get ready for new episodes of Madison on the Air to premiere the first of every month.